Welcome. Welcome to UC San Diego. Welcome to Eleanor Roosevelt College. Welcome to the International Hall, I mean, to the Great Hall of International House. And welcome to the lecture series, The Making of the Modern World, To Be Human. My name is Alan Houston. I'm the provost, the chief academic and administrative officer for Eleanor Roosevelt College. On behalf of the college and the university, I'm thankful that you're here and welcome you to this extraordinary occasion. The Making of the Modern World is the signature sequence, course sequence, within the general education requirements of Eleanor Roosevelt College. It covers, over a course of five quarters, human history from the dawn of time until the contemporary age. It uses methods from almost every research field known to the modern university, history, philosophy, anthropology, sociology, economics, literature, political science, you name it, it's a part of the curriculum. Completing the sequence is a rite of passage for students at Eleanor Roosevelt College. I had the opportunity today to eat lunch with uh, a gentleman who graduated in the first graduating class of Eleanor Roosevelt College in 1992. I asked him, he was interested in celebrating the 20th anniversary of his graduating class at the upcoming alumni reunion weekend. And I asked him, what would be the signature things that you would identify with? What would bring you back to the university to identify with and to be a part of? And the first thing that came to mind was the making of the modern world. It's a sequence that all of our students are held together by that they identify with. Last week, at the first of this lecture series, I compared MMW to boot camp. When students begin it, they're anxious, anxious by the rigors of the course. By the middle of the course, they're exhausted because they work very, very hard. By the end of the course, they're proud proud that they have learned so much, proud of the new knowledge, proud of the new methods and skills that they've achieved. After last week, I was talking with one of the students who had attended the lecture, and he said, as I was describing this boot camp experience, he was saying, yes, right, that's exactly what it is. But he said, you got one thing wrong. The pride doesn't come only at the end. The pride comes throughout. And it was a good reminder to me that learning is about a process. It's not just an end result grades and tests and so forth, but in fact it is a process itself that can be meaningful and the making of the modern world is that process. The series that this is the second lecture of, the series To Be Human, was conceived last spring by Steve Cassidy and me. We started small, perhaps three, four, five lectures, some faculty who have taught in MMW get together with a smallish audience. We thought if we were lucky we might get 60 or 80 people to attend a lecture about MMW. And then we began to let our imaginations grow. And Steve will tell you more in a minute about how this program has developed. But it has become this extraordinary occasion and opportunity. We have now close to 275 people in this room. The waiting list I checked before I came over is now 117. It is truly extraordinary. To me, that is a wonderful reminder of how much interest there is in the community in sharing in the kinds of knowledge and research that the university makes possible. This university is dedicated to the advancement of knowledge through excellence in research and education. Community engagement and public service are at the heart of the university's mission. And in keeping with that mission, this series is really intended to share with you, with members of the community, with faculty and staff, with parents, with alumni, with those who live in San Diego and beyond, to share with you the treasures of this program. The intellectual treasures, some of the knowledge and insight and judgment that comes through keen academic study, but also the pedagogical treasures, the educational treasures, the teachers who are so extraordinary, so inspiring, so capable of prompting all of us to think. This current lecture, the one given tonight by Professor William Propp, would not have been possible, nor would the series itself, without the support and collaboration of many units on campus, the Chancellor's Associates, UCSD alumni, parent and family giving. Each of these organizations has helped to put together the entire series. Tonight, the televising of this particular lecture is made possible by the support of the Judaic Studies program. We're grateful to each of these organizations on campus for helping us. As I've said before, 
The series was originally the brainchild of Steve Cassidy. Steve is a professor of Slavic and comparative literature here at UC San Diego. He's also an associate dean of graduate studies. From 2001 to 2007, he was the director of the Making of the Modern World program. Tonight, he is our moderator. Please welcome Steve Cassidy. Thank you, Alan. I just love this initial moment. Look how many of you there are. That's just marvelous. Thank you so much for coming this evening. Last week, we began the series kind of from the ground up. If each lecture in the series is designed to answer the question, what does it mean to be human from a different perspective and looking at a different dimension of human life, perhaps in a different era, of human history, we really started from the beginning in many ways, chronologically speaking, and also in the physical sense. Last week, we talked about what it means to be human, <clears throat> excuse me, at the physical and biological level, both in the sense of the origins of our species, but also in the sense that each of us, as a human being, is very firmly rooted in the physical environment and depends for sustenance on that environment, and that's what Professor Margaret Schoeninger talked about last week. Tonight and for the next three weeks, we'll be talking about this question from the spiritual, religious viewpoint. Tonight, Judaism, and in the coming weeks, we'll be treating Christianity, Buddhism, Taoism, and Islam. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I wanted to mention a couple of things about the format. The format is the speaker talks until about 8 p.m., and from 8 till 8.30, we have questions. If you have a question, we'll ask you kindly to come to one of the microphones to speak directly into the microphone. If we don't hear you, the speaker or I will repeat your question for the audience, and we'd like to ask you kindly to ask one question per person. Thank you very much. Tonight's speaker, it's a great pleasure to introduce to you Professor William Propp. First, I have to say that Bill and I come from the same hometown, Great Neck, New York, so you know he's got to be brilliant. I don't know if you've been following Great Neck in the New York Times lately. If you have, Bill and I are the two guys that did not pay somebody else to take the SAT for them. <laughs> Bill because he was honest, and I because I couldn't afford it. <laughs> Bill has been on the faculty here since 1983. He got his education at Harvard all the way through. He specializes in civilizations and languages of the ancient Near East. He knows more ancient languages than I can even name for you this evening, specializing in biblical and Judaic studies. He holds an appointment in the history department and is on the faculty of our highly esteemed Judaic studies program, which is helping to sponsor tonight's event. He is known throughout the world of biblical scholarship as the world's top authority on the book of Exodus. He has written two very lengthy books on this topic, Exodus 1 through 18, weighing in at 720 pages, and Exodus 19 through 40 at 865. Copies of Exodus 19 through 40 um, which I thought I had here, are on sale over here. You can purchase them after the lecture and encourage you to do so. My introduction would not be complete if I failed to mention that um, Bill Propp, in addition to being the brilliant biblical scholar that he is, <clears throat> is a concert-level bassoonist, singer, and a professional-level ping-pong player. <laughs> He will be speaking tonight on the topic in his image and likeness, being human in ancient Israel. Please join me in welcoming to the podium Professor William Prop.
We didn't know each other at all. I remember your younger sisters slightly. Lately. Lately. I think she played the cello, right? That long hair. I remember that. Um, um, what does it mean to be human is not a new question. And we have some very ancient answers to it. Just as peoples of antiquity had intellectual endeavors we can recognize as science or analogous to what we call science, and they certainly had technology, they also had anthropology, theories on human nature, culture, and how they evolved. What kinds of evidence did they have? They didn't have the fossil record. They didn't go traveling to exotic places. But they had an intuition of psychology because they were, after all, human beings, and they watched how children grew up. They had some ability to do ethnography because the, rich eat, the Middle East was a rich melange of different kinds of cultures and lifestyles. They lived with barnyard animals and could come to some conclusions about human behavior from that. And they had introspection and common sense. And as we go through ancient Israelite anthropology, drawn from the Old Testament, we'll find interesting parallels to what we think of as what it means and has meant to be human, as well as divergences from us. Now, we might also ask if they had memories of certain developments in human history. Probably not, but it's worth getting some chronological context. Around 10,000 years ago, and that's an important number because I was thinking before the lecture how humbling it is with 54 years of life on this earth to look out at what I calculate to be roughly 10,000 years of human experience sitting in the room and for me to tell you anything about what it means to be human. If you add up all our lifetimes, around 10,000 years ago, there occurred what we call the Neolithic Revolution. Of course, it didn't happen at once. It was a long, slow process, but it was very important. For 200,000 years, Homo sapiens had been living one way, foraging, hunting, very precariously. And then they discovered they could domesticate certain crops, especially the ones that grew quickly, were fat, were disease-resistant, obviously non-noxious and nutritious, and they could domesticate certain animals breeding for key traits of gregariousness. They clung together and would not shun you. Fatness, slowness, and stupidity. <laughs> Very important. And this was the Neolithic Revolution. The way we lived changed forever. We're still living with its consequences. Farming, herding, no longer hunting and foraging. There actually was a subsequent phase of human evolution with the advent of refrigeration. Because if you think about it now, almost all of us are scavengers. We eat meat someone else has killed. This is the, the latest phase of human evolution in terms of diet. Um, but after the Neolithic Revolution, things started changing very quickly. People simply had more energy to devote to other enterprises and the value of communal enterprises became more and more apparent. Compared to um, hunter-gatherers, Neolithic folk had more security in their food supply. They started building cities over the course of time. These are slow developments. Walls. They could organize themselves around an alpha male or a chieftain who could organize armies to allow them to rob their neighbors and get even more stuff. Life was more secure, but it was also exhausting. That's the paradox, too. We find life exhausting, and we have it completely easy. We spend more hours working, actually, than people do in what we think of as more primitive environments where you forage and you hunt. Once... Um, Pottery was invented in the seventh millennium. They could hold things better. In the fourth millennium, roughly the same time, we think, these are all BC, of course, we have metallurgy and writing. Permanence of artworks, permanence of vessels, permanence of ideas. 
no longer reliant on word of mouth, oral tradition. We know what that's worth if you've ever been the uh, victim of gossip, say. Knowledge became fixed and it became accumulative. And I could go on about how the human mind changed in response to the fixity of words on papyrus, on clay. Living in cities, living surrounded by other people, created a sense of humans as distinct from the natural world. Anthropologists tell us that all humans, however they live, hunter-gatherers too, have a sense of being human as opposed to being in the natural world. But certainly, the Neolithic Revolution, which subdued nature, heightened that sense of distance from nature and heightened the sense, or at least the illusion, of control. And I would argue fostered certain kinds of neuroses that pop up in our ancient literature, such as the Old Testament, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Book of Ecclesiastes. What do you do for solace? You turn to religion. As human society became more complex, so did the heavenly society ancients created in their own image. Heaven became a bureaucracy with an alpha god at the top, and the way you obtain security in life and solace was to find influence, to find a way in, to find a lesser god who would speak on your behalf to the big god. There's a fascinating Mesopotamian document which advises you to treat your personal god like a dog. Feed him by sacrifice, but not too much. Keep him hungry, then he'll do your bidding. So the Neolithic Revolution, as we call it, occurred around 10,000 years ago. Half the distance back to then, humans started writing 5,000 years ago. Everything before 5,000 years in this part of the world we call prehistory. History is 5,000 years old. The floruit of the Israelite civilization was half that time again. 2,500 years ago, we could say, is when the bulk of the Old Testament Hebrew biblical writings had reached their current form. So in terms of time since the Neolithic Revolution, they're three quarters of the way towards us. Um, to put a little different perspective on that, though, we know that technology has been changing in an accelerating rate since the beginning when it took tens of thousands of years to think of chipping a stone this way instead of that way. So technologically, they were much closer than we are to this pivotal moment in human history. I don't know that they had um, direct memories of it. They really couldn't have, but they understood that there was something novel and revolutionary about the way they were able to live, as we shall see. I'm going to do um, what I always do in my classes. Uh, we're very low tech, no PowerPoint. I learned what PPT stands for yesterday. I know what PowerPoint is, I just didn't know the phrase PPT. I used it once, it, it, it flustered me, I said. I mean, I, one term I used it, it flustered me. The uh, librarian, I think I saw him here, the Judaic Studies librarian once complained to me that uh, the faculty were not utilizing fully the digital resources. And I've said, you know, we finally accepted the existence of the book as superior to the scroll. Give us time. <laughs> so at any rate, if you forgive me, I'll be flipping through my database here to find the passage that I, passages that I want to direct you to. As we say in my classroom, did you receive your handouts? You did? Okay, so I'll be talking about the passages on those handouts. Any discussion of what the Israelites thought it meant to be human is going to begin, I would imagine, with Psalm 8. Um, Psalm 8, verse 4 says, When I see your heavens... You is God. When I see your heavens, the work of your fingers, um, the moon and the stars that you fixed, and then you're supposed to supply, I say to myself, what is humanity that you pay any attention to him, or the son of man, meaning humanity, that you, and then there's another word for pay attention to him. <laughs> um, I'm not reading the King James, but I'm making my own translation up. It's not as good. You, but you gave him a little less or made him a little less than gods. You crowned him with honor and glory. You caused him to rule over the works of your hands. 
you put everything under his feet, meaning subdued everything, subjugated everything to him. Um, sheep and cattle together, also the wild animals of the field, birds of the heaven and fish of the sea that pass through the ways of the, of the seas. And we get this idea that humanity has something quasi-divine about it. Now let me comment on this, this translation, you have made him little, little less than gods. Hebrew word is Elohim. The Israelites were monotheists, at least the biblical authors, with an asterisk, but it's the same asterisk you would apply to Jews, Christians, and Muslims, especially Christians. You need two asterisks for Christians, but for Muslims and Jews, one asterisk, saying that, yes, of course, there are immortal, supernatural spirits, angelic beings. We don't worship them, but they are between us and the divine. The Israelites had exactly the same notion. Confusingly, they call these beings Elohim, the same word they applied to God. And so another way to explain this is that paradoxically, the Israelites, the great monotheists, they called their God either by his name, Yahweh, that's like calling me Bill, or they called him Elohim, God, that's like calling me Professor. It's what he did for a living. He was being God. He was ruling everything. But it, it's actually a plural, meaning gods. It's probably, to get grammatical, some sort of plural of abstraction, meaning your godliness or something like that. My point is that it's the same word in the Hebrew Bible, when it's used in the plural, is to be translated gods. Um, if it says, worship Elohim, you know it refers to the one God of Israel. If it says, do not worship Elohim, you know by context it must mean all the other gods. Sometimes they're called messengers, or in our translation, angels, from the Greek word for messenger. But often they're called gods, or the sons of gods, which is a Hebrew way of saying members of the class classification gods. There were other gods. The surrounding peoples, the Phoenicians, called their pantheon the same thing, the sons of gods, or the gods, or the holy ones. They existed. The Bible reflects different theories about what their role was in the world. The Bible is very clear you're not supposed to worship them, so apparently we know people did. But this reference to gods will come up several times in the course of our evening as a measuring stick for what humans are and are not. So from this passage, it would be natural to jump back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis, you must know, we've discovered in the past 200 years, was not written at one time in one place, but grew by a process of accretion and combining. You don't want to go into it, but you do much better. Save your money, don't buy my book, but buy our former colleague Richard Friedman's, who wrote the Bible, which explains it all very clearly why we think this. Um, so we're going to discuss different stories in Genesis, not assuming they were written to be read together, even though we re read them together now. In Genesis chapter 1, as you all know, describes the creation of everything and among everything, human beings. In verses 26 through um, 30 is where this happens. The animals have been created, the birds and the fish. Everything has been called forth by divine fiat, Latin for let it be. But God speaks differently when it comes to creating humanity. And Elohim, God, said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. This can mean only one thing in the ancient world, that God has two arms and legs just like us. They always refer to the parts of God's body. We are made in God's image in a very physical sense, just like all the other ancient peoples believed their gods looked like humans. Let us make man, mankind, in our image, same word means statue, if you want to think about it that way, and in our likeness, so that he may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heaven, and the beasts that are on the land, and everything that walks with feet upon the earth. So Elohim, singular God, created the human, or rather humanity, in his image. In the image of Elohim, he created him. Male and female, he created them. What does this tell us about the image of God? 
does it mean that God is androgynous physically? Probably not, although there are androgynous deities in the ancient world. Um, more likely it means the, the rough, anatomically, you know, bipedal, two arms and a head thing that our species sh uh, sh shares between its males and its females. But in the image of Elohim, he created them male and female. Another way to take that is that the word Elohim has shifted its meaning slightly in mid-course. He made them in the image of gods, male and female, and the problem disappears. I'm not exactly sure if that's the way it was meant to be read because this is a somewhat later and, and rather militantly, militantly monotheistic text elsewhere. But it's intriguing that they have this notion of the plurality of the name for God and that we are in his image or their image. It says both male and female. Um, how are the humans made? By some sort of collaborative effort, male and female. But to whom is he speaking when he says, let us make? We always have to point out that unlike Queen Victoria, ancient Near Eastern rulers did not speak in the plural. So that's not what this is about. Um, other ancient Near Eastern peoples believed that the creation of mankind was a collaborative effort, usually between a craftsman god and a goddess. So I would take this at face value, that the pantheon is being summoned. They're not named by name because this source doesn't like referring to them. I can talk more about that later if you want. But are being summoned to collaboratively make humans in their image so that they will rule over creation, sort of in place of God. In this notion that they had, as I'm trying to argue, their anthropological sense of the evolution of our species, how did they think first humans subsisted? Well, we were herbivores, presumably gatherers, not meat eaters yet, but we ruled over everything. Now, people often find this kind of sinister today. They look at our environment and our ecology and say, we've abused our rule. I'm not here to judge that. I will say, um, I don't take this claim at face value. It isn't entirely relevant, but I'm, I'm feeling around here for my watch is what I'm doing. You just flag me if I've been going on too long. Um, there's a, one of our oldest Egyptian texts is from the Pyramid of Unas, around 3000 BC, I think. And he describes over and over again how he's not afraid of the gods, how he's going to eat the gods. He's going to use the minor gods, break them in pieces and use their leg bones to scrape the pots. And he's just going to, it's a totally unique Egyptian text by a man who obviously was terrified to die. So when humans in the Bible vaunt their control over nature, I wonder, we know the next time we have a big tembler here, we're not going to feel like we rule nature. We know that it's a very fragile illusion. I think it must have been for them too, living in a drought zone, an earthquake prone zone. Um, so much for Genesis chapter one, which comes from what scholars call the priestly source. I can talk about that also if it's appropriate. Genesis chapter 2 gives a different take on how mankind was created. For one thing, the order is different from chapter 1. In chapter 1, the creation order is animals and then men and women together. In chapter 2, it's man. And then God says, you know, it's not good for man to be alone. And I always say, but who really feels lonely? But it's not good for, for man to be alone. So he creates the animals, brings them to the man, sees what he thinks. Aardvark, no. Porcupine, definitely not. <laughs> and then he brings them the woman, and he says, more or less, this time you got it right. It, it, it almost says that. <laughs> um, there is humor in the Bible. It's, it's very dry. I can give a whole lecture about that. Um, it isn't that dry. We're just conditioned from childhood. We're slapped if we laugh, you know, so we don't think it's funny. Um, this chapter 2 from the so-called J source uh, tells us that the first human was simply called Adam, human, um, made out of clay. We're not told how God or the gods made man in chapter 1, but in chapter 2, we're made out of clay. And this clay has been infused with God's breath, and so we're alive. We're apparently vegetarian as well. We're not really gatherers, 
because God plants this garden and puts man in it. You often have this image that man is just lolling around the garden. It's not so. He's supposed to work. It says in verse uh, 15, he's there to keep it and to work it. What he is is a horticulturalist. It's apparently light labor, but he has to do something to keep the fruits on the trees. Um, The animals are similarly animated clay. So to speak anachronistically, the first man, oh, here's my watch. I was looking here and it was here. This is because men were hunters and we hyper-focus. The women were gatherers and they kind of, it's all the time. So to speak anachronistically, the first humans were golems. They were clay beings with a divine spirit into them. And they are horticulturalists. Are humans by nature solitary? We take it for granted we're not. But we don't always take it for granted. When Thomas Hobbes said the life of primitive man was solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, he was very wrong about one thing, solitary. For reasons that have to do with his environment, he somehow imagined a solitary human. But just as an ant by itself or a bee by itself is not really an ant or a bee, it can't do all the things that ants and bees have to do. A human by itself, well, it won't survive if it's cast away at birth, or even childhood, and even a human by itself would go mad, almost certainly. We are a social animal, and that's, the, that's what it really means, I would say, when it says it's not good for man to be alone. It's not God projecting his own problems. Um, so now we have company, we have sex, and we have sexual dimorphism, something that's alluded to in Chapter 1. Sexual dimorphism is what you see when you go to the orangutan exhibit. And the orangutan is the only solitary great ape, by the way. They do not live together. It's terribly unnatural. When I see the orangutans in their pen, I think about humans in their cities, and I wonder you know, how they feel, how we feel. But when you see orangutans, you can tell the males and females, even if you're not an orangutan. And with humans, it's not quite as obvious, but we certainly can tell the males from the females. And I imagine the people, when they find that you know, thing we send out into space with a picture of the man and woman, they'll, they'll see the difference as well. Um, some of you are too young to remember that, but I, was that Voyager, whatever it was called. Um, whether from studying animals or studying children, the authors had a sense that there's something unnatural about clothing. I see a colleague here, and I was charmed visiting him when his little toddler would take off her clothes at every possible opportunity. Um, I have other colleagues here with, um, with whom I went through Lamaze class 19 years ago. I'm glad to see old friends um, that I've met in different contexts. Um, that early humans were naked, something that we as anthropologists also find to be correct. And the origin of clothing is one of those many steps, I don't know if it's an improvement or not, but that separates us from the natural world. These, these um, two humans had no sexual same. Presumably, they coupled like beasts. It's a human universal not to do that. You can't always find privacy. People don't have bedrooms in most cultures. But to the extent possible, discretion is used or people look the other way. As with how we treat our dead, another universal. We don't think it's appropriate to leave our dead corpses of our fathers and mothers lying around, and we don't think it's appropriate to have sexual intercourse in public, but these two didn't have that problem yet, presumably. They had no sexual self-consciousness. Um, they're not living in the wild. They're living in, the, in a zoo. They're living in a garden, this idealized combination of nature and culture that brings a sense, a sense of calm to us. We feel like we're in nature, but we know we're safe. Our word paradise comes through a convoluted um, set of language borrowings from a Persian word for a garden. I learned a lot about literature from telling stories to my children, one especially. So once I read him a really insipid uh, story by Beatrix Potter, much worse than Peter Rabbit, but it's that author. And when I was done, he looked at me and said, but what's the problem? Every story has a problem if it holds our interest. The story needs a problem, so God creates a problem, right? He puts two trees in this garden and tells man they can't, touch one of them, or they cannot eat from one of them. He actually gives this command before he creates the woman who was lodged somewhere in the man's abdomen. (laughs) 
at the time, so maybe she doesn't know, or, or who knows what. Maybe he told her and told her wrong when she came out of his body. But um, two trees, the tree of life and the tree of a better translation is the tree of knowing good and bad. Um, that's grammatically more accurate. It also conveys the fact that bad and good in Hebrew don't refer only to morality. Just as we say, this banana is bad, we're saying something different. This music is bad, we're saying something different. Um, words good and bad encompass morality, but Hebrew has more specific words if it reads means moral good and moral evil, and it's not using them here. So man, as you know, is is allowed to eat of the tree of life, presumably. We find out as the story evolves, he never got around to it. That's the, some certain ineptness in the way the story is told. We have to infer this by what happens. But they've been told not to eat from the tree of knowing good and bad. I call it in my notes here the KGB, knowing good and bad. <laughs> um, this dichotomy between eternal life and knowledge is very much part of what they thought it meant to be human, both in Mesopotamia, as it happens, and in Israel. At the end of the story, in, in chapter 3, verse 22, um, verse 22 um, Yahweh says, Look, the man has become like one of us. Who is he talking to? He must be talking to the other divine beings that the author doesn't want to make explicit are there. The man has become like one of us, knowing good and bad. And now, what if he sends forth his hand and takes also from the tree of life and eats and lives forever? And they're expelled from the garden. This tells you what could happen if you ate from the fruit. Tragically, they didn't. Tragically, they didn't. And we were meant to be immortal, but we are not. What happens after we leave the garden is that our longevity slowly, gradually decreases. The oldest humans in Genesis live, um, well, Methuselah, as you know, and he lives, I think, 966 years. Adam lives 930 years. It almost seems like there's a number of thousand that they are decreasing from over the generations. But we certainly die sooner and sooner the farther we get from the primordial humans who lived in God's presence, at least maybe smelling the fruit of life. I, I should say that um, it's not an apple. That's actually a Latin pun. Malum in Latin, two homophones, means evil and it means apple, and that's where this notion emerged. Of course, it's not something you can get in the produce section. It's a knowing good and bad fruit. Same as with the, uh, the life fruit. They're unique. So, Guided by the snake, who's just a snake, not the devil or anything, the first woman feeds the first man, the first gift. You know, that's a stage of, of childhood development, too. Un letting go, giving something. It establishes a precedent for reciprocity, the basis of altruistic coexistence between people. As we say, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Okay, what is KGB? What does it consist of? Well, the woman, nudged by the snake, thinks that in, in chapter 2, verse 6, that the fruit is desirable um, for various reasons. It's good to look at. She has an appreciation of its beauty. She thinks it will taste good, a culinary appreciation, and it's desirable to make one wise, an aspiration that we endorse. It's why you all are here, to become wiser. Um, the uh, lack of KGB is made tantamount to blindness. The snake says, the reason you can't eat this fruit is because God knows your eyes will be opened. Um, and its first effects, their eyes are open. What do they see? Oh, my God, I'm naked. And secondarily, hmm, he's naked too. And they also hide from God on the, as we know, false justification that they're naked. It's not proper. They're not naked. They've put on fig leaves. So here we have an anthropological theory that humans at some point became conscious of their nudity, as must be the case, and made garments out of what was at hand. Leaves. Why they're figs, we do not know. Um, 
So the no, knowing good and bad doesn't seem to do a whole lot for you at first. Is this such a big deal? We eat this fruit? This is what God doesn't want us to have? Knowledge of our nudity? Well, when we want to know what a Hebrew phrase means, if it's not a unique one, we look elsewhere in the Bible. Um, parts of the books of Samuel are very similar to these stories in Genesis, possibly if Dick Friedman is right, written by the same authors even. So this phrase, good and bad, and knowing good and bad, recurs um, in 1 Samuel 14. A woman has come to King David for judgment, for justice, and she's flattering him. And in 2 Samuel 14, 17, she says... Um, for like an angel of God, so is my Lord the King, to hear or to understand the good and the bad. So here, this, this chimes very much with what we have in Genesis, that to know good and bad is being like an angel, to be like an angel. In verse um, 20, she says something similar and explicates further. Um, my Lord is wise like the, wise like the wisdom of an angel of God, knowing everything that is on earth, as if knowing good and bad is some sort of universal knowledge. That makes more sense in terms of what God is presenting to humans as a choice. You can live forever or you can know everything. What you cannot do is... Another passage that uses similar phrasing is 2 Samuel 19, 33 to 36. And here there's an old man named Barzillai. He's 80 years old. And he says to the king, I'm 80 years old, do I know good from bad? Can your servant taste what he eats or, um, or what I drink? Can I hear any longer the uh, voice of male and female singers? It implies that losing KGB is, is losing um, one's aesthetic One's perceptions, one aesthetic senses. It's blindness, it's deafness, it's lack of taste, something that does happen to people. This is part of having KGB, to be able to taste things and appreciate them. Something that adult humans have that, according to this, an old man lost. Last passage that sheds light on this is Isaiah 7:16. This is the famous oracle about the um, birth of Emmanuel. Um, but it's describing the birth of a child. Um, uh, verse 16 says, Before the child knows to reject the bad and choose the good, the land will be abandoned. It's slightly different. This could refer to some kind of moral discernment, but possibly it means that in addition to the very old, the very young also lack KGB. Okay, I want to put this all together now and again compare it with our anthropological theories. In our terms, KGB is post-Neolithic post civilization, the world we live in. By the end of the story of Eden, humans are set apart from and above nature. Female is made subordinate to man. There's a theory here that men and women were more or less ega equal, egalitarian, as they are in almost in some very, very, very few societies. And even then, I know of one in Melanesia where men and women do almost exactly the same things, except the men only are allowed to kill with a spear. The women can kill, but not with a spear. And I love it. What men may not do is clean up the public area. That's women's work. <laughs> um, but in the more developed societies, and the Israelite society, patriarchy is the norm, and hierarchy as well. Once you have... Um, a post-Neolithic urban society, someone has to be in charge. People specialize in different tasks. You can't do everything anymore, and there are more and less prestigious jobs that are assigned to people. Well, after um, the whole Garden of Eden story, which I'm kind of self-conscious, I haven't actually told you the story. I'm assuming it's sort of familiar. What happens at the end of the story? Okay, they eat the fruit. They're in trouble. And they get punished, the three of them, the man, the woman, and the serpent. The woman is being punished with inferiority, social inferiority to the man. What the man is punished with is farming. The great Neolithic revolution is seen as man's curse. We used to live in a garden, in a protected garden, where we just had to, you know, do something to in induce the growth of the fruit, and then we just pick it 
and eat it. Henceforth, we are farmers. Now, a modern anthropologist would say soon after this, animal herding came into practice. That comes up. But there's a hint already at the end of the Garden of Eden story, maybe, because the humans get a change of clothes. They're no longer wearing fig leaves. They are wearing leather. The second form of human clothes was leather. Where would you get leather from? Well, a real ancient human would get it from killing an animal. Uh, through hunting, where God got it from. When we tell the story to children, we say, ask me another question, right? We don't know. He says, let there be leather, and there was leather. Um, and they're expelled from the garden. The origins of human migratory patterns. When you study human origins, you're told that we all emerged out of Africa in, in fact, several waves. We came from one place and dispersed, and this is what is going on in Genesis as well. Chapters 4 to 11 really explore the consequences of KGB, or our post-Neolithic society. The story after the Garden of Eden is Cain and Abel. Cain is, he's living out the curse of Adam. He is the first farmer. Abel is the first shepherd. These were the two basic Israelite forms of subsistence. They were not hunter-gatherers. They were shepherd farmers. Now, farmers and shepherds need each other. It's uh, carbs and fiber from the farmer and fat and protein from the shepherd. They'll, they won't be properly nourished unless they interact. And yet we know from Oklahoma that the farmer and the cowboy <laughs> have trouble sharing the land equitably because they both need soil and water. So we do have conflict. And this is part of what underlies the story of Cain and Abel. Um, we have the first act of murder. Is this part of KGB? Possibly. The gods in all ancient cultures do kill, do take life, do take human life. Uh, Cain and Abel are also busy sacrificing. It doesn't make it explicit, but presumably by fire, which is what the Israelites did. But nowhere do they say so-and-so invented fire, as you might expect. We have Phoenician comparable anthropological texts that do discuss the man who invented fire. In fact, his name was Fire. It was named after him. Um, we talked about Eve giving a gift to her husband and the notion of reciprocity, and I scratch your back, you scratch mine. In the story of Cain and Abel, we get the other form of reciprocity. I punch your nose because you punched mine. And vengeance is equally part of what it means to be human, and it elicits the need for regulation of vengeance through justice. That's what much of the rest of the Torah is going to be about. Just as in Exodus chapter 2, Moses gets involved in some vigilante work which sets up the legislation that the Israelites receive at Sinai, so Genesis chapter 4 sets up some of the rudimentary laws that are going to come down from God about taking human life. Um, Genesis 3, actually I mean chapter 4, 17 through 22, really very fascinating. Here... We read that Cain knew his wife, and don't ask me who she was. Actually, my son went to the museum of, of uh, the anti-evolution museum we have in San Diego, the Museum of Creationism, and one of the kids asked the docent, "Who did Cain and who did Cain marry? Because wasn't it just his sister?" And the docent said, um, "Oh, you can have sex as long as you're married." <laughs> um, she, I'm not thinking too hard. Um, so Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Hanoch he built a city so here we have urbanism right after farming and herding we have urbanism just as we would say and, and Hanoch, to Hanoch was born Irad and Mucheel and a bunch of other people whose names are on your handout I'll come back to why and a man named um, Lamech is there and he has two wives, polygamy. And he's a bully and a boaster, which kind of goes with the patriarchal polygamous society too. Is that he has a child named Yaval. He's the father of everyone who dwells in tents. And there's a missing word, raises cattle. Here we have not just herding, but pastoral nomadism, that you have to go abroad and live in a tent, not live in a house to do large-scale um, sheep raising, sheep and goat raising. 
Then we have another brother, Yuval. He was the father of all who hold the harp and um, some wind instrument. It means oboe in modern Hebrew, I think. And then his other wife bore Tuval Kayan. And the word Kayan probably originally meant Smith. It was Mr. Smith. But his son, Tuval Kayan, there's again, the text is corrupt, but it must have said, the father of everyone who works bronze and iron. So here we have the origins of metallurgy in the sort of post-Neolithic world, and we would agree with that. It seems to think that iron and bronze are coeval. We know that's not true. Um, well, it is true because they sometimes had meteoric iron, but you know, really the Iron Age was later. But they did sense that iron came along soon after that point. Now, um, the names, uh, there's a problem here. According to Genesis, if you read it straight through, the descendants of Cain should all die in the flood. So how are they the fathers of all these lifestyles? Well, if you read the, the text straight through, you have to believe father here means originator, not ancestor. But I think that they meant father. This genealogy of the sons of Cain ends in a guy named Lemech. Could someone lend me their handout? Thank you very much. Um, now, in Genesis chapter 5, we get a list of the descendants of Adam of the line who do make it through the flood. Adam has a son named Seth, and Seth has a son named Enosh and Canaan, all the way down through a guy named Lemeth. If you look at these two lists of names, you find that they're oral variants of one another. Canaan, Cain, very similar. Hanoch and Hanoch are the same name, just in different places. Mahalalel, Mahuyael, very similar. Metushalach and Metushael, very similar. The most different names, and then we have Lemech and Lemech, identical. The most different names are Enosh and Adam, but guess what? Those are the two, human, the two Hebrew synonyms for the word human being. This is a variant um, derivation of the first human, and they both end in a character named Lemech, who is the father of the flood hero Noah. So I suspect behind some of this is a version of the story in which we are the children of Cain, the first murderer which also tells you something about human nature. We can, in the text as it stands, we can disassoci disassociate ourselves from Cain, but probably not in this tradition, because after all, murder and warfare is part of human nature as well. Okay. However that may be, we have a great flood. And, you know, somewhat facetiously I say it's the birth of navigation. Well, they weren't steering, presumably. But this business about sending out birds, which they do in the flood to see if the water has receded, this is something that mariners used to do. Before they invented the crow's nest, they realized if you send a bird up, it can go very high, it can see over the horizon, and if it heads someplace, follow it if you're looking for land, see? Um, so some of not navigational science seems to be um, discussed here. And human, not deep seafaring, but navigation is surprisingly old. Um, Lemech has a son named Noah, and when Noah is born, his name is Noah, and it says, this one, Yinach Amenu, will comfort us from the labor of our hands and the toil from the soil that Yahweh has cursed. And you'd ask yourself, how does Noah bring mankind comfort? There is an obvious answer that isn't very plausible, namely he rescues everybody. But what is the more, if you know the story of Noah, what happens after the flood? Wine. He is the first viticulturalist and the first maker of wine. Does alcohol give us comfort at the end of a long day of work? <laughs> yes, it does. And then it did as well. So here's another human institution retrojected into right after the flood. And just as the earth was cursed and we had to work it by the sweat of our brow, so as a kind of divine gift, because in the ancient world the greatest boozers were the gods themselves, um, Noah, as he restarts the human race, has an antidote to the curse of Adam, alcohol. <laughs> but you must be 21 in the state of California. <laughs> well, one thing we've scarcely heard anything about is hunting. 
A modern anthropologist would say it's a formula, hunter-gatherer, hunter-gatherer. The Israelites mentioned hunting, but it was not really how they got their food because, you know, some days you kill the bear and some day the bear kills you. They had these sheep, which are very stupid and trusting animals. Um, hunting was apparently something foreigners did, like Esau. Um, but in chapter 10 of Genesis, there's this reference to Nimrod, the king of Mesopotamia, who's a mighty hunter before Yahweh, whatever that means. But the kings of Mesopotamia like to display themselves, as the pharaohs of Egypt did, as great hunters. So hunting doesn't get enough attention from our perspective. In chapter 11 of Genesis, the Tower of Babel story, we have big architectural projects. And yes, over time, humans started building bigger and bigger and bigger a more intense communal effort, the sense that once again humans united can threaten the divine realm and as he did at the Garden of Eden, God almost acts out of fear when he stops this endeavor by creating all the languages of the earth. This, the story of the Tower of Babel answers the human question, why can't we communicate better? Why do we all speak different languages? It also may answer a different, more subtle question, except for the Philistine language which they lost probably um, and started speaking Canaanite, all the languages in this part of the world are related to a greater or lesser extent. So just as it's kind of obvious that Italian or Spanish are related, even if you did not know there was such a thing as Latin, you might surmise they once were one tongue. So I think they had this notion that our language is the reason we call a, he a dog kalb, modern Hebrew kelev, and it's called a kalbun by these Arabian tribesmen and a kalbum in Mesopotamia, it doesn't take uh, Noam Chomsky to figure out that these languages must have been one at one point. In short, my wrap-up, right on time. Um, in Israel, to be human is to be a mortal god, to be a paradox, to have the knowledge, knowing good and bad, but not to have eternal life. We pressed the wrong button at the beginning of time. We possess civilization and hierarchy and bureaucracy like the gods. We are able to procreate and to create, but our bodies are pottery. They dissolve to dust. The primordial pun is our curse. The Hebrew word for mankind is Adam, and the Hebrew word for the ground is Adama. We are dust. The Hebrew word really means dirt. We are dirt, and to dirt we return. Now I want to close with one last passage, a um, fitting one for our university. Proverbs 3, verse 18, which tries to peddle you on, the half, on behalf of the sages of Israel an antidote, a solution to this paradox that we chose KGB, we rejected, or we were denied, the fruit of life. According to Proverbs 3.18, wisdom, in this quintessential book of wisdom, wisdom is the tree of life. And everyone who grabs hold of wisdom is blessed by possessing knowledge and wisdom. You can have it both ways. I think back um, to UCSD. Where is our repository of learning? our ever-shrinking repository of learning. It's our library system, um, now very much more concentrated in our signature piece of architecture, the Geisel Library. Well, if you're going from Warren campus and you're on your way to the library, 